All right, good evening. Um, welcome to the last plenary of our 2019 AAAS annual meeting. And uh, this will be one of my last acts as your AAAS president. Um, I'm Peggy Hamburg, by the way, I guess I should have said. And I'm really delighted to be here tonight to introduce Dr. Lucy Jones, who will be delivering our plenary lecture entitled Science Activation, How Do We Get Our Science Used by Those in Power? So I think that we uh, will be really energized by her presentation as we go out into the world for this meeting to continue to try to make a difference. First, before we hear her, I do have the great pleasure of presenting two of AAAS's most distinguished awards. We begin tonight with the AAAS Mentor Award. The AAAS Mentor Award honors an individual who, during his or her career, has demonstrated extraordinary leadership to increase the participation of underrepresented groups in science and engineering fields. The award recognizes an individual who has mentored and guided a significant number of students from underrepresented groups to the completion of doctoral studies or who has impacted the climate of a department, college, or institution to significantly increase the diversity of students pursuing and completing doctoral studies. So let's learn more about this year's recipient. The AAAS Mentor Award honors university faculty and administrators with distinguished records of mentoring underrepresented minority students working on PhDs in STEM fields. This year, we honor Erica Camacho, the Associate Professor at the School of Mathematical and Natural Sciences at Arizona State University. Her efforts have promoted the advancement, retention, and inclusion of underrepresented minority or URM students in the mathematical sciences. Camacho uses her own experience to mentor students and instill in them the belief that they can succeed regardless of their starting point. Camacho knows all about overcoming long odds. She rose from an underprivileged background in East LA with the help of her math teacher and mentor, Jaime Escalante. Escalante is the famed calculus teacher featured in the 1988 movie, Stand and Deliver. You're gonna work harder than you ever worked before. And the only thing I ask from you is ganas, desire. From Escalante's East LA class, Camacho went on to earn a degree in mathematics and economics from Wellesley College in Massachusetts, and a PhD in applied mathematics from Cornell University. Now, Camacho is the mentor, influencing hundreds of students. She has supervised 89 undergraduate researchers and mentored more than 600 undergraduates. She has shared her personal story and mentoring advice with almost 8,000 people through keynote addresses and talks at academic conferences. Following these events, she's mentored another 820 individuals one-on-one. -on -one. Finally, she founded the Applied Mathematical Sciences Summer Institute and co-directed the Mathematical and Theoretical Biology Institute, which together reached more than 140 students. Camacho has demonstrated extraordinary leadership to increase the participation of women and underrepresented minorities in STEM fields. Erica Camacho, recipient of the 2019 AAAS Mentor Award. And I'm delighted now to be able to actually present the award to Dr. Erica Camacho. <laughs> Very impressive and wonderful that we could do that this evening. And now, our next mentor award, the AAAS Mentor Award for Lifetime Achievement. This award honors a sustained commitment of 25 years or more to the same set of goals and ideals that I just mentioned. So let's learn more about the distinguished career of this year's awardee. Like the Mentor Award, 
The AAAS Lifetime Mentor Award honors university faculty and administrators with distinguished records of mentoring underrepresented minority students working on PhDs in STEM fields. This award, however, is directed towards individuals whose mentoring success spans more than 25 years. This year, we honor Elizabeth Gwynn, Professor of Physics at the University of California, Santa Barbara. For 30 years, she has been a tireless advocate for diversity in her UCSB department through her continuous support of women and underrepresented minority, or URM, students. To date, half of Gwyn's PhD students have been women. More than half the visiting students she mentored to PhD completion were women. About one-third of her undergraduate researchers have been women, and one-fifth URM students. She has directly mentored 10 women and URM students who earned doctorates in physics and chemistry, and she's established multiple programs to promote underrepresented students in the STEM disciplines. Gwyn also led the NSF GK-12 program at UCSB, which fostered STEM education at the K-12 level. She advised the graduate student-led Women in Physics group for more than 16 years and oversaw the establishment of the School for Scientific Thought at UCSB, a STEM mentorship program for high school students. Her commitment to ensuring that anyone, regardless of race, gender, or economic status, should be able to succeed in STEM careers transformed her department and improved the lives of students. Gwyn's excellence as a mentor is apparent in the success of her former PhD students and the programs she's established to provide financial support for them, as well as the science education she supported for underserved communities. She is a mentor who invests deeply in each of her students, providing thorough guidance well beyond degree completion. Elizabeth Gwynn, recipient of the 2019 AAAS Lifetime Mentor Award. It's now my pleasure to present the award. Well, I think we're off to an inspiring start, seeing what a difference uh, individuals can make in the lives of so many. And I also want to mention that there were several other significant AAAS awards and honors presented at other venues during the course of this year's annual meeting, including the AAAS Kavli Science Journalism Awards and the AAAS Subaru Prizes for Excellence in Science Books. So congratulations to all our winners tonight and those who've received recognition over the past few days. And let me remind you that nominations are now open for our 2020 awards. So please visit AAAS.org slash awards for more information. And now I'm very excited to be able to introduce our headline speaker for tonight. Dr. Lucy Jones is the founder of the Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society. The mission of the center is to foster the understanding and application of scientific information in the creation of more resilient communities. She is also a research associate at the Seismological Laboratory at Caltech, a post she's held since 1984. In March 2016, Dr. Jones completed more than three decades of service with the United States Geological Survey, where she led the uh, USGS's long-term science planning for natural hazards research. In this role, she developed the first American major earthquake drill, the Great Shakeout, she called it, that's expanded to now encompass 55 million participants around the world. Dr. Jones began her career researching approaches to earthquake clustering and went on to write over 100 published papers on statistical seism seismology and integrated disaster scenarios. Her research into earthquake occurrence probability and the short-term probability of foreshock and aftershock sequences created methodologies for assessing earthquake probability that have, in fact, been the basis for all earthquake advisories issued by the state of California. She served on the California Earthquake Prediction Evaluation Council from 2003 to 2015 and was appointed by the governor of California to the California Seismic Safety Commission from 2002 to 2009. Her pioneering science was recognized with the Samuel J. Heyman Service to America Medal, one of the just eight that have been awarded to federal employees 
in 2015, the Ambassador Award from the American Geophysical Union, the William Rogers Distinguished Alumni Award from Brown University, where she, needless to say, was an undergraduate, the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Western States Seismic Policy Council, and most recently, the 2017 Distinguished Lecture Award of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. I could keep going, but I won't. Um, Dr. Jones holds a bachelor's degree in Chinese language and literature from Brown University, and I understand she's quite fluent. She also plays um, the viola da gamba and composes music. We, we just learned moments ago, and she has a PhD in geophysics from MIT. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lucy Jones. Well, thank you all, and I'm impressed that you're all still here at the end of the conference, so thank you for hanging out for this. Uh, I'm going to talk today about what I like to call science activation, that uh, looking at the issue of how do we get science really engaged in the community and used to inform policy decisions. I mean, I think we all agree that there is a, a, a crisis even in our society about how we use science. We all know about climate change denial on one side, uh, but there's also all the issues about opposing GMOs or, or anti-vaccination. And what we are seeing here is there is a significant part of society that doesn't understand how the scientific process works and looks at scientific information as something you get told to believe because the scientists said it's true. And then if you're gonna believe that authority figure, there's several others that you could turn to as well. So obviously this is a problem that goes beyond just uh, the scientists, but we have a role within this and a, a addressed ways in which we can address this that I hope that we can uh, look at ways to move forward with it. And this is more than science communication. Science communication is obviously a very important part of the process, but it, is, it involves a unidirectional approach. The idea in science communication is that I have information and I'm trying to get it to you so that you, you can uh, accept that information and be able to understand it. Uh, activation, if we put it on the other term, would be rather a bilateral communication process in which we engage with policymakers and actively work with them. And this is exchanging information to understand the problem at hand because when you really are trying to find solutions to some of these difficult problems, it is not just a scientific issue and you need to really weigh how the various scientific results compare with what are the other constraints on what they can be making. And what we are trying to do is empowering the use of the information rather than just accepting it. So what are the challenges to undertaking science activation? I think we've all seen this as we um, uh, you know, watch the march on science. But there are significant issues that, are, that go behind the problem. Why is this a joke? Right? So I want to start with looking at what the culture of science is and the ways in which that culture interferes with communicating beyond our group. I think most of you probably know the XKCD cartoon. Um, and you know, normal people say, I'm not going to do this again. And the scientists, let's see if it happens over and over. Right? The point is, is that the scientist understands that we, need, we don't get the right information out of stories. The plural of anecdote is not data, right? We need to be able to test what we're doing. We need to make sure it is repeatable. And so we avoid stories for a very, very good reason. Um, you know, I mean, as a, somebody who's been involved in the earthquake prediction research, all that time I spent in China uh, in my graduate student days was a time when we still thought earthquake prediction was possible because we would have anecdotes. We would hear that X or Y happened before an earthquake. Let's go, but you can't predict an earthquake with it. You need to go see if it happens again. I brought up this one. I think that the whole thing about uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation pulses 
had happened before one earthquake, and millions, tens of millions of dollars have been spent trying to track it down. And at this point, there's still no evidence that it's any more than a story that misled you. All right? So we try very hard to avoid stories. And the problem, of course, is that that is how people make decisions. When you look at what role do stories play in human decision making, you need to think about how we came to have rational thought. We evolved the ability to, to reason, uh, to protect ourselves, to be able to figure out, you know, make patterns, make theories about what was happening with the predator, but we did it in a hyper-socialized setting. So we were rewarded for winning arguments, which does not require being right, right? It requires emotional connection and it requires being able to manipulate somebody else's emotions, right? And so we have a very strong tendency to believe in things because someone told it to us that we trusted, we have emotional connection to, rather than being right, right? This is called a confirmation bias, uh, as, I mean, it, it, Confirmation bias is a little bit more than this. It is our tendency to be more open to data that supports our current view and more critical of data that opposes our view, sometimes called an internal yes man, right? And that process of that is the reason that we had to develop the scientific method. Human nature does not do logical reasoning very well. We have to work at it. Right? So how does it work? Let's think about what it is that we do when we undertake experiments, right? We might notice a coincidence, say, between electromagnetic radiation and that earthquake. We want to go and figure out whether or not it's actually coincidental, right? We are human enough that there's a lot of people that stumble at this point. They have, you know, we really want to believe the pattern's there and accepting the data that says it's not is sometimes a challenge for us. But we uh, hopefully get through that, or at least get caught uh, along the way. We create a model that's consistent with known data to explain the relationship. And we make predictions from that model and test the predictions using statistics. Again, we know that the anecdote alone doesn't tell you what's going on, and we go through statistics to see whether or not the pattern actually exists. We present the results of all of this to our colleagues through meetings, through papers, at which our colleagues then rip us to strips, right? That's what we do. And it is a necessary part of the scientific process because the easiest person to fool is yourself. Every one of us is subject to the confirmation bias as much as any non-scientist. And in fact, the fact that we believe in data actually means that we are more susceptible to confirmation bias. If you really don't care about data at all, you, know, you have a different way of in reacting uh, to the whole process. So we then learn to communicate by never giving the answer first. You know that you're going to be torn apart if you do this. When you go to tell your colleague about the great new results you had, you first lay out the background. You tell them the approach you took. You give him your, date, your error analysis and show that you properly considered all of the uncertainties. And you do all of that before you give the result, because otherwise you, the result is going to have triggered him to start opposing it. All right? So we naturally communicate in this way, and it's fundamental to what we do. And we actually wonder, why would anyone have a problem with this? The reality, of course, is that most of the rest of the world communicates in a very different way, right? Le read any newspaper article. It starts with the main results. It then tells you why it's matter. And it's only if you read to the end of the article that you actually get to see how the, how the result was being done, right? So why? do we worry about the fact that we are communicating in the way we do? They can, you know, some people have to wait a bit for the result. They should understand it's important. Well, let's go back to these challenges that we're really facing. What happens is we end up talking about our uncertainties. And when you talk with the larger public, talking to your colleague, Talking about the uncertainties is critically important to show you've done the, the work the right way. When you talk with a, a policymaker, they often hear, rather than an analysis of uncertainties, they hear that you are uncertain. Right? So what's the problem with that? We understand that uncertainty analysis gives you the 
under, understanding of whether or not something is true, right? They hear it as whether it is that we are uncertain, and uncertainty decreases action. One of the things that's been able to be understood is that when people think it's uncertain, you increase anxiety. Instead of giving an answer, you increase the uncertainty that they're feeling, you increase their anxiety, and you actually reduce the actions. Right? So we will often be in a position where we try to sound as certain as we can. And in many ways, that is a good thing, but we have to be very careful because if we act, if we act more certain than we are and it comes out that we were wrong, it really can backfire. People hear that as uh, that you really didn't know what you're talking to about and then they don't hear you in the last time. This is tied to the risk perception that people, how people perceive risk. Right? Uh, if you've never read it, the, the book on risk perception by Paul Slovic is a really wonderful way to get started into this. People do not analyze risk in a logical way. There are a lot of factors that determine whether we are afraid of something that is not connected to um, what, what the risk actually is. It's very clear that we are more afraid of things that we can't see coming. It's more, we are more afraid of things that it's uncertain whether they will be there. And if there is a perception that it is unknowable, it greatly increases the fear. Think about the fear people have about radiation, that it feels like unknown, un weird science, and we don't know when it's coming. Earthquakes also push all of these buttons. Well, these are actually pretty old buttons because when you go back to the older uh, world in which we evolved, the unseen predator is a bigger problem. You know, if you can see the predator coming, you know how to act to it, but it's that the possibility that it could be coming out from, from the forest and you're gonna be caught by surprise, and that leaves us feeling much more frightened. Right? So, and this is tied to the idea that we really want to have patterns. When we evolved our brains in this uncertain world, right, we, the ability to make patterns kept us safe, helped protect us from the predators with bigger teeth and stronger muscles. What we had was the ability to make a pattern and figure out where to move to safety, how to deal with that predator coming af out after you. Um, so the ability to create patterns is what kept us safe, and it's often incredibly important. Think about the ability to hypothesize a connection between your gastrointestinal distress and the mushrooms you just ate. That ability to make those connections made us safer, gave us the ability to, to, uh, uh, to survive and pass on our genes. The problem is, is that we make patterns whenever we see them, even if they don't really exist, right? So, that we make a lot of patterns, and that gets back to that testing of the scientific method. It's the way in which we determine whether or not the pattern that we think we're seeing is actually true. You know, so I'm a disaster scientist. I have spent a lot of the last decade really working on helping people comprehend their risk and figuring out how, how to manage it. So I have faced this fear of randomness at a pretty deep level. Think of the word disaster. I don't know if you've ever thought about where it came from. It actually first shows up in Shakespeare. It comes from disaster, ill-starred. It represents the belief that disasters happen because your fate was written in the stars. When we have been faced with a truly random distribution, like why did this generation get hit by the erupting volcano and the other generation didn't, we just can't believe it was random, too bad, you got, you're out of luck. We try to find a pattern. And when the pattern doesn't exist, we make up other ones. So, you know, the traditional Roman culture said that Vesuvius erupted when, after Venus cheated on Vulcan and he had a male hissy fit, right? They had to come up with a pattern to explain it. And this has pervaded Western culture. Uh, when you get into the Judeo-Christian tradition, they said no. God's good, God's somebody you can make a covenant with. He isn't just gonna go and have a temper tantrum on you. So if he, pun if he hits you with a disaster, it must be your fault. And we have a very strong tradition in Western culture that uh, disasters happen as God's punishment. This was so pervasive a belief across Europe 
that even as the Great Enlightenment got started, we didn't have studies of earthquakes because those were coming from God. We studied various other things of physical phenomena. This stayed true until the Lisbon earthquake of 1755, a magnitude 8.7 that destroyed much of Portugal, brought down um, most of Lisbon, and it happened during the mass on All Saints Day in a heavily Catholic country. Right? Every church collapsed because they were built of stone, mostly down in the river sediments. Right? Unfortunately, well, fortunately, fortunately, uh, the whorehouses were basically spared because they were in wooden buildings up on the hills. It, formed, it created a rather significant philosophical problem, <laughs> um, <laughs> trying to understand how this could happen. Um, uh, there were big uh, philosophical debates between Voltaire and Rousseau. Voltaire rejected the idea that God could have done this as punishment. So he was seen as an atheist because if you, if you didn't have the disasters coming from God, you must not believe in God at all. Uh, Rousseau argued back, no, it was people's problems for making that decision to stay in town, uh, even though, um, you know, he obviously, he didn't believe in, in, in urban life. He was a, a naturalist promoting that. And he said, besides, we don't know what worse fate they got spared. And you, you sort of got to wonder how bad he thought living in a city was that the Lisbon earthquake was the, the lesser fate. Um, but uh, among the rest of the country, I mean, the Catholics just said, we clearly need to kill some more Protestants. Um, the, the Protestants said, what more proof do we need that the, the Inquisition is the devil's work? And in fact, the, the Calvinist government in, in The Hague was asked for aid for Lisbon, and their response was literally, God has decreed how much the people of Lisbon should suffer, and it is not our place to interfere with what God has decreed. So this has had a huge implication for human society. And we still are working at evolving out of that here in the West. It is not restricted to the West. It is a basic human desire. In the East, they didn't uh, put cause, say the earthquakes were, were caused by God. They said it was a result of a yin-yang imbalance. There's a, a treatise from the second century BC in China that goes into great detail about how much too much yin will lead to earthquakes as the earth overpowers the sky. Too much yang gives you hurricanes as the sky overpowers the earth. Um, this also has lost some credence with time. It still was a significant uh, factor in the overthrow of the shogun in Japan. And even in the 1976 Tangshan earthquake, um, that happened six weeks before Mao died, and Mao had very much held some of that role of the emperor in, in that culture. And um, they didn't exactly accuse the Gang of Four of causing the earthquake, but if you look at the uh, indictment of the Gang of Four after Mao died, they used words from that traditional treatise about usurping the emperor's power or overthrowing uh, the emperor to, to tie into that deep down uh, emotional response to how uh, the earthquakes could be caused. So this is just to show you that throughout human history, we have a great fear of randomness, and that really affects our ability to look at these things, and we try to find patterns no matter what happens. So I said that if we're trying to be too uh, certain when in fact we aren't certain, this can be a bad thing. Uh, this is uh, some data from some, some social scientists looking at the response to, uh, I, if you remember, peanut contamination. There was salmonella in, in pe peanut products. They were very certain that there was no connection. When they were proved to be wrong, there was a huge return in media coverage and spikes of reports on this, showing that when you are act as though you're certain and you get proved wrong, it undermines your ability. To, to further communicate. I mean, I think one other example of this, if you look at what has gone on in public health and the ideas around the food pyramid in 1992, there was a desire to try and get people to stop having saturated fats, um, and they thought that people would have a difficult time uh, recognizing the difference between saturated fats and other bad fats, so they just called all fats bad and said that grains were really good because it was really too hard to explain the difference between whole grains and, and white uh, uh, 
processed foods. Uh, and of course, we now recognize that this is not such a good idea, but we have had this public uh, use of this in a way that has actually harmed, I think, the, the health of our, uh, of our country. And when they went to try and change it, they were afraid, and for good reason, of changing it by too much. So now we have this healthy eating pyramid where they've tried to sort of shift things around, and you notice the white bread's now up in the top, and they put exercise at the bottom and try to shift it because we are afraid of changing the message along the way. So this provides a lot of challenges for us where we need to try and be as certain as we can be but then we're also faced with the issue about whether or not uh, things have actually changed. And let me, so I sort of jumped on. Uh, oh. uh, this is not going, okay. Um, so when we look at these things about the challenges, I said the too much focus and uncertainty, and what has happened is we have been most successful when, uh, science reduces the uncertainty rather than when it increases it. One place you can see this is in the response to earthquakes. Um, and we have, a, without countries around the world, you will find it right after the earthquake. Everybody runs to the scientists and wants us to tell them what is happening. And if you actually think about it, why do people care what fault an earthquake happened on? it will not help them rebuild their house, right? But people, the, the media comes to us because they are, um, uh, because providing information reduces fear. We give the earthquake a name, we give it a number for the magnitude, we give it a fault, and we are saying somebody understands it. And this has been, over decades, a very positive place of interaction. It's led to a lot of my public visibility because I was the person they turned to. And I, I find it very astonishing because I think of myself being a scientist out there providing them this information. And I have had so many people tell me, I feel better when you tell us what's going on. You're a source of comfort. I'm like, Say what? But what it is, is I am reducing uncertainty. So I think this is this really important issue that science activation is most successful when it reduces the uncertainty. One thing, however, that increases the uncertainty is the way in which we generally communicate about science results. Because the newest science is not consensus science. When you come to your... Uh, uh, disciplinary meeting, and we give our press conferences, right? You come to give a talk at a meeting. A little less so here, more in the more core distribution ones, right? But we go and we give a press conference about it. And this is on work that has not yet gone through peer review, right? It's the newest stuff. So you're there and you talk about it and you have this great result, and you're PR department from your university pushes you to go and do this because this is going to get you good coverage, right? But next year, there might be another talk that says, you know that thing last year? That was wrong. We found this, and don't believe those people over at JPL, us over here at Goddard have got a better picture of what's going on. And what the public is hearing is, oh, they said this, then they say that. We are increasing the uncertainty, presenting a picture that we don't know what we're talking about because we have a fundamental issue that the larger community doesn't really understand the science process. And what we are doing in our conferences is the first chance to vet your ideas with your colleagues, and you do it to get the feedback, to find the things you better add to that study before you go to publish it. It is likely not going to turn out to be the final answer, and yet it's the one that we are promoting to the public. And we don't really have an alternative at a different time to get people that consensus science. Because when you get to this consensus science, right, we get bored, right? Once everybody agrees it's true, we stop working on it. That's the time when we walk away from it, right? So you look at a policymaker, they're taught something in college that would be reasonably free, you know, recent uh, consensus science, 
They're now 20 years out from college. They've been hearing these news reports going back and forth as people do their cutting edge research. But they, once it's settled, they haven't heard what that final answer is. And I think that we need to really focus on how we support scientists working in this realm of communicating consensus science that's not yet, you know, that's not sending everybody back to college um, because they haven't heard the most recent things. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one other aspect of this is when you think about um, how we talk about the need for STEM education. That is almost always qualified. There are so many STEM jobs. We don't talk about it as though everybody really needs to understand how STEM works, right? I think we can actually make an argument that uh, the internet is playing something of the same role that the printing press, play, printing press played. Think about Europe a thousand years ago. Nobody knew how to read and write. If you needed to read and write, you got a specialist to do it for you. Even the king didn't read and write. We had scribes. What happened with the printing press is that easy access to the written word turned reading from something that only the specialist did to something that everybody needed. I mean, you could still get a job, but you really couldn't participate in that larger um, social discourse. Uh, we are now in a position where the internet has really changed the way in which we distribute information. Now, it doesn't cost anything to go out, so you don't have an editor checking the facts and making sure that it is worth distributing this information. Everything, whether it is true or not, is easy to access. Right? And we are watching the consequences of that as lots of misinformation goes through, and we have a larger society that has been told, believe it because the scientists say it's true, rather than saying, believe it because you understand for yourself how it works out and how the logical reasoning works. And I would argue that this, the skill of a science researcher is the skill to analyze the significance of a set of data and determine whether or not it's true. And that is a skill that everybody needs to handle the flood of information coming in through the internet. And I really believe strongly that we have to change the way we think about STEM education for everyone. We shouldn't be accepting that some people just can't do it, right? They probably can and they haven't, but they've been discouraged out of it. And we have to recognize that maybe not everybody can understand this at this level, but we all need to try and we need it just to keep society functioning. Um, so that's a pretty big list of problems. Um, let me talk about what I think can be some solutions. And I think that the solutions are going to be different in different situations. I thought about have, how to do this, and I thought what I would do is just share one um, situation that I was able to be in and look at what lessons we can learn for success. Uh, it didn't really get mentioned, but in the year of 2014, uh, I convinced the USGS to enter into a technical assistance agreement with the mayor of Los Angeles that led to me spending the year of 2014 in the mayor's office at least four days a week, one of the most tiring things I've ever done. I, uh, ever, I, I'm from Caltech. I'm used to introverts. There's no introverts, I think, in City Hall. And it was a, it was a challenge to, to spend the whole time there. But the result was the biggest change to seismic safety that we've ever seen in the state of California, uh, ever. And, that's, and it's the first time we've ever had any changes without an earthquake to trigger it. What ended up happening within this report um, is several recommendations about how buildings should be uh, handled, mandatory retrofit of over 15,000 da uh, dangerous buildings. Uh, the law was actually passed in 2015, and more than half of these buildings are already into the completion, into the retrofitting process. We will, within seven years, have gotten rid of 15,000 buildings that we're going to be killing people. Right? Several other things as well there. We also tackled the water issues. The fact that the damage to our water system is likely to cause $50 billion in business disruption cost alone. We also face the possibility that the fires after the earthquakes could burn down the city and a lack of a water system uh, will be a, a, 
significant hindrance in that uh, capacity. Uh, and they set up, actually there's seven different recommendations within this, but the city has made a commitment to a future of a seismic resilient system and is, is already well underway towards getting this to happen. And lastly, there was also a big effort on the communications. This is a picture of Cajon Pass, where Interstate 15 leaves the LA Basin, or that's San Bernardino Valley, heading out to Las Vegas. That's where the San Andreas Fault runs, uh, and where Interstate 15 crosses the fault, there is also within 400 meters, we have two uh, petroleum product pipelines, a natural gas pipeline, a major electrical transmission line, and one third of the internet connectivity for Southern California to the rest of the world. They're all gonna break at the same moment when that fault moves. And we have finally, after decades of trying, gotten traction on this. The mayor got the governor to connect, and we are now working to try and mitigate against these, ris against these risks, many of which could be prevented with just a little bit of engineering. All right. So this all got through. Everything that required a city council ordinance was passed unanimously. We had the Building Owners and Management Association Building owners facing a billion dollars of retrofit to old concrete buildings, standing with the mayor and saying, yes, we need to get this done. So how did it, and, and then it's not done even there. We completed all this with Los Angeles. Uh, then the Southern California Association of Governments came to me and said, we really would like to take this to the 191 other cities of Southern California. And uh, this is part of the why I, I decided to complete my federal service. I have been working with them. We've gotten 40 cities actively working within cohorts, developing retrofit legislation. There's probably, we are now, have over, the jurisdictions representing more than 10 million people are undertaking retrofit legislation at this point. So we have really moved forward and we are seeing a, a huge amount of work going on. So why is this working? I think we can learn some lessons about how, why this time has been able to connect that I think are important looking forward. One of them is that we based this on a scenario. So we had created the shakeout scenario of what the big San Andreas earthquake would be like. Instead of saying, here's the probability of the earthquake, which is focusing on the part we don't know, I said, this, the probability of this earthquake is 100%, just give me enough time, and when it happens, this is what the consequences are gonna be. And the consequences are very significant, and we really went through, and we, we got great modeling of what the ground motions were gonna be, turned this into the engineering, and created a program where people could see why uh, a certain action would make a difference. I think the value of the scenario is a couple one. One is that a scenario is a story. It's a scientifically defensible story, and by far the hardest part of it was getting the scientists to stop shooting each other. Uh, one of my colleagues called it a circular firing squad. Um, but eventually, we were able to get to agreement that this was, if this happened, nobody would be surprised. Right? And then we could turn it into a story, and literally the public version of it, we started 10 minutes before the earthquake and went to six months afterwards. We also were able to avoid talking about probabilities. That wasn't the issue, right? And probabilities focus on what we don't know instead of what we do know, right? And then we emphasized consensus. We only, we, to get the firing squad to, to put down their guns, we had to agree to things that were consensus. So we haven't had to deal with people coming along afterwards and saying, well, I think this or I think that or undermining it, which is what happens to most of our studies when we release them uh, through press events at, at conferences. It also allowed us to emphasize financial in outcomes rather than on the uh, fatalities. There aren't as many fatalities as many people think there would be. But also we wanted to focus on the economic part because when people are focusing on whether or not they're going to die, it increases the emotion level that they're dealing with and makes it a little harder to get the logical reasoning going through. A second thing that I think was also really important was separating what were the issues for science and for policy, even as we work together really closely. Right? The role of the scientists and engineers in this project, and I brought in a lot of, this wasn't just me, I mean, we had, we had lots of people that came in, we had the mayor's technical task force, all of these things. Our job was to say, what are the consequences of the decisions, but still leave it to the elected officials to make the decisions. 
And I think that that is a really important division to make. I had to face it, you know, they had me in, this was going to be the Jones Report, and then I pointed out if it was the Jones Report, it would have to go through internal review at the U.S. Geological Survey and make sure that there was no policy in it, because that's a requirement for USGS publications. Um, and so we were working closely, but it wasn't the Jones Report, because in the end, the mayor got to decide what was in it. Right? And we, there was actually only one area, it was the retrofit of concrete buildings, which was potentially so expensive that we, you know, it could have been a situation where the mayor would have chosen to go voluntary. And I couldn't make him go mandatory, even though I knew a mandatory, a voluntary program wouldn't work. So it was really important to recognize that difference, but also for me to get right up to the line so that they had the information to make the decisions. Just the science work by itself didn't empower them to use the information. They really needed help to understand what exactly it meant for their policies. Another aspect that I think was really important is this was not something that we did off in City Hall and then came out and said what was going to happen. In that 10 months, I spent, I had 130 public meetings over that 10 months, and we engaged with a large number of stakeholders. And people have, a, notice the word stakeholders, they have a stake if they've been engaged. And even if the end result only has a tiny little bit from them, they can see their fingerprint on it, they know they were part of it, they were much more likely to engage in it. But to get this to work, I had to be out there really sharing that science with the Urban Land Institute, with the Central City Association, with the Los Angeles Conservancy, all of that, if it had been done by somebody from the mayor's office rather than from the scientist, it would have, wouldn't have been believed. And I think the last part, and this gets back to the emotions of stories, but relationships matter. This didn't happen out of the blue. This happened because we had had years of involvement with LA City Hall since we did the first shakeout scenario, and we developed those relationships, and we had something to build on. So what does this mean going forward? I think one aspect is that science communication is incredibly important, but it is not just for science communicators. I think we need to help all researchers understand how the communication process is working. And this is, I mean, not everybody's going to be out there talking to the public, they shouldn't be, but I think if we understand why we always give the background and methods before we give the results. That'll help us be able to understand when that's appropriate and when it isn't. And I'd like to see a better understanding, not just of outside communication ideas, but a better analysis of our internal, you know, science culture, communication norms, because that'll help us in understanding where they're appropriate and where they're not, right? Um, I also think that we need to, look at science education for the broader public, more focused on process rather than results. You know, and this is another place where the internet has really changed things. You know, when, when I was in school, if you want to learn those facts, you sort of had to get it from the teachers or, you know, and learn enough to be able to go out and start doing research. Now, if you want a result, you can get it on your computer right away. What we need to do is not be teaching kids, for instance, that, you know, dinosaurs evolved into chickens, but rather how to recognize that the connection between dinosaurs and the avian species uh, website is more reliable than one that tells us we, dis we um, descended from visitors from Mars. Both of them are out there on the internet, right? Um, I think there's also, we really need to think about the products that we're creating. I think this, I, I especially see this with climate change. But one of the reasons we were able to move forward in LA was because we had chosen to do the shakeout scenario. I mean, maybe we would have gotten some of this without that, but that was a really effective tool. And there are questions that are more interest to the scientists and ones that are more useful for working on the impact. And we need to make sure that those more practical products get supported and get done. And, you know, we have to support the, the researchers who are willing to do this. The space between research and, and the users, uh, a friend of mine at Caltech calls it a demilitarized zone, 
We're afraid of getting in there. You know, the work in there, when you're working with settled science, the consensus science, you get criticized on the academic side because you're no longer really, you know, doing the cutting edge work. We need to provide more support for those people in between because what we produce in our academic journals is not at a state where a policymaker can use it. Uh, I've been taking, I want to end just by saying one thing that I've done to, to try and move forward with this. Um, uh, Caltech gave me the opportunity to do a workshop, which we conducted last month, uh, uh, with about 20 graduate students. We had room for 20, we had 60 apply. We're gonna be repeating it in the summer. And in fact, we discovered there's enough information. We're probably turning it into a, into a quarter long course. And we seem to have a lot of interest among the students. The students recognize that we can't continue the way we have been in the academic institutions. We look at what's happening in this world and we discover some of the problems from being as isolated as we have been. So we worked with them about looking at these uh, sort of aspects of, of science communication and cultural norms, uh, worked at how to develop messages for policymakers, what's gonna be listened to, some really practical hands-on stuff. It, I didn't teach it alone, I worked with somebody who actually came out of a background of being a political staffer and has now sort of formed a niche of helping scientists communicate with policymakers. And then we actually took them to City Hall and we brought in some federal and state officials and it was incredibly exciting. I think there's a lot of opportunity going forward, but I think one of the things that surprised me was how uh, happy the policymakers were for this opportunity. We had all of them say, if you do this again, we wanna be part of it. We've had several of them follow up with the students that they met with, actually trying to use the information that they had been bringing to them. And one of them ended up saying, you know, is there a place where we can get this type of, you know, this reliable information, and they, it, given where it was, you know, with the Caltech brand, right? So that we know that it's reliable. I think that need for under, how to figure out which science you listen to and what you don't is a big issue for policymakers, and they're waiting for us to come out and help them. And we just need to figure out how to do it the most effective way. Because well, I'm gonna end with the, imagine if you heard, you saw somebody walking out among a busy street, what would you do? Would you yell out, hey, there's a car coming, watch out? Or would you yell out, hey, remember, mass, force equals mass times acceleration? <laughs> That's the relevant science but it's not what they need to hear at that point. And we need to be ready to work with them at what they need, how to turn it into what they can use, um, because with this future, we're all in this together. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Now, we're gonna take just a little bit of time for some q and I'm very lucky that I get to ask her some questions. So please join me over here. And I have to say it at the beginning, since I have been a public health official trying to respond to crises um, at a tender young age in New York City as health commissioner and most recently as FDA commissioner. Um, and in fact, the Peanut Corporation of America um, a contaminated peanut paste was the first crisis I had oh. to deal with at the FDA, so I felt myself getting a little bit, you know, queasy. Um, but I wish I'd heard you speak before I took on those roles. <laughs> um, but, you know, one of the things that, that, you know, has been a frustration to me, and I wonder your perspective, is, you know, there can be a crisis. The issues about what we need to to be better prepared for the next time are kind of obvious, but then the issue fades, people aren't so concerned, the, the political leaders and policy makers have been distracted by a million other problems that have emerged, and you enter into this phase of complacency, and it's very hard to you know, get attention again. Um, you know, you were able to be very effective in part, I think, because of your shakeout scenario. Absolutely. One of the biggest challenges obviously facing us, um, which is sort of a, a, a quiet crisis, but with catastrophic implications is of course climate change. You mentioned that briefly. How should we be communicating about climate change today so that we can really galvanize the action that's needed 
to forestall the catastrophic implications of the future? I, I've been trying to think about that, and you know, in the, uh, historically, California seismic safety is all immediately post earthquake. You know, the 33 earthquake happens and, and destroys 70 schools, we get a law about school safety, et cetera. And we had never gotten any action without an earthquake before this. So one could look at this, you know, maybe this is how we did it, but I, th I think there's two things. One is the scenario. I think that would help, and I really think that the more climate change researchers can say, we think this is going to be the situation, you know, and the shortest time period we possibly can, because we need to have some urgency with it. Um, that would help. But I sometimes wonder if it would be possible at all. I think part of what's happened in seismic issues is that with globalization, we now look at earthquakes elsewhere in the world and have a stronger emotional connection because we're seeing it. You know, when Tohoku happened, I sat in real time in my living room watching a drone, a picture from a drone showing the tsunami moving across the Sendai Plain. It was actually pretty amazing. We got people really connected really quickly to what the issues were. And I think that's allowed us to get more traction on our own earthquake issues because we have the emotional connection. So we have to find some way that helps people understand the emotion here, that this really should be terrifying us. And how do we change that impact? And, and one of the ways I think that maybe the only way it can happen is going to be tying the disasters that are coming to the climate change. You know, we've been seeing this now. People are much, the scientists are much more willing to say, yes, Harvey was caused or made worse by climate change, at least. The intensity of the wildfires in California. That makes it more real and that gives that, that fear of, ran it tap taps mm -hmm. into the fear of randomness that really does make a difference. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. But as you were talking, I was thinking about another concern that, that I used to grapple with and, and others as well. Sometimes the public focusing on a different aspect of the problem than you really expected. We actually had on stage just a couple nights ago an um, uh, uh, official from Japan who was talking about that it was, it was you know, surprising and disturbing to him that people focused on the risk of the, the Fukushima um, nuclear plant uh, damage and, and potential radiation exposure where no one died and kind of forgot that 20,000 or so died, died from the tsunami. And, um, and during the, um, the period when we had first an Ebola outbreak and then there was Zika, right. more Americans felt that they or their family was at risk for Ebola than for Zika. And you know, the, the risks were just so completely discordant. So I'm just curious also in your experience, you know, have you encountered that, but also how do you counter that in terms of your education communication strategies? I've encountered it a lot. Uh, earthquakes are sort of one of the ones that, that push the buttons. They're unseen, it's unpredictable, you don't know when it's coming, and we have, uh, even though we know a lot about predicting where the damage is, that's often not the message that people have. They think we can't predict it. And that, that all increases it. So I spend a lot of time saying things like, uh, don't worry about dying in the earthquake, worry about living after the earthquake. Or, you know, it, you're far more likely to be bankrupted by the earthquake than, than be killed by it. And it's only so successful. I think this deep wired thing I, it, you aren't going to change that aspect of human nature. It's why the crisis communication is really different than the long time communication. Mm -hmm. It's all tied into those same issues, and I think we more have to figure out how to use it uh, rather than fight it. Because I, I quite seriously, I, uh, we can say it over and over and over again, and people just do a really bad job of relative risk assessment. Well, in you know your experience now working as a communicator to the public in crises and also working with politicians to, mm -hmm. to try to better prepare. Do you think that the strategies are significantly different in terms of how you communicate with the public and, and how you entice politicians? I mean, it was amazing to me to hear you talk about how effectively you were able to move this 
activity and this adoption across not just Los Angeles, but many cities so quickly, relatively, even yeah. though it had huge economic costs, yeah. more regulatory requirements. Yeah. Uh, you know, is it, it, it is we're California. going against the grain. Okay. But, um, yeah, we, regulations aren't such a big issue. And in fact, the more Republican parts, or the most conservative parts of the state, we haven't been able to get the retrofit through. Um, so there, there's still some of that that goes on. Um, I, th there's a couple of things. I, I mean, there is an aspect of it that because I was their comforter in the earthquake, people, some people will listen to me in a way that they wouldn't listen to others. And you know, people, other people can say the exact same thing. Um, it's one place, bizarrely, where I think my gender's been a help. You know, when you're really scared, you feel better when mommy tells you it's okay than daddy. <laughs> and, and so the guys will do exactly the same thing after the earthquake and not get remembered, and I do. So, and, and that's sort of a hard one to, to replicate, but I don't think that's all of it. I, I guess I think that it's the shift in globalization. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of it's what we did, part of it was having the story, but another part of it is a, a real change. I mean, the, the Sumatran tsunami, was really the first global mm -hmm. event. I mean, I knew just about everybody I knew knew somebody or you know, you know two or three degrees of separation to somebody who died in that tsunami. Really? Yeah, because, well, you know, it's the largest disaster in the history of Sweden. More Swedes died in the Sumatran tsunami than in any natural disaster in Swedish mm -hmm. history because they were on vacation there in, in Thailand. And so it was sort of our first global disaster. And I. I think it's been a connection around people, and I do think that that's making something of a difference. Somehow we've got to tap into that for climate change. And so I, I, I think, you know, this is just coming up to me now. If we could- <laughs> Making news <laughs> at the AAAS <laughs> annual meeting. I know, I, I'm thinking, I've been hearing reports about the, you know, forest fires in boreal forests, that have, what's happening in the Arctic is just so dramatic. If we could get people's stories you know, that are getting burned out of, uh, you know, burned out of their homes in northern Sweden. That helps make sort of some of that case, and we have more connection. We, you know, we, we feel more connected to people around the world, and I think we should be working at getting more stories of the climate refugees, because they're started and they're, and they're coming in greater detail, and I think we need that human side of it to believe the rest of it. You get the human side in the story to compel the action, and then you use the science to say, how do we come up with a solution? We don't want to use anecdotes as evidence, but we want to use storytelling to engage. Well, and that, I mean, it is a real challenge for us. We know stories are really dangerous. It's been very hard for me to accept using stories. Because especially as a seismologist mm -hmm. in earthquake prediction, oh my God, I know the problems of anecdotes, <laughs> right? And, and so this is really pushes my limits and yet recognizing the degree that it matters has really made a difference. Well, we're coming to an end of our time, but I have to say that as both a scientist and a storyteller, you're very compelling. <laughs> Thank um, you. And we really appreciate your taking the time with us this evening. Thank it's you. It's been great. I think I appreciate it. Thank you. So, thank you so much for really a fascinating and inspiring presentation and discussion. And uh, she actually does have a book that's recently come out. You want to say the title? The big ones. <laughs> How natural disasters have shaped us and what we can do about them. And it, it, I haven't read it, but I um, actually uh, listened to an interview on YouTube about it. And it, it, it takes the reader through really some amazing episodes in history that I have to say I'd never even heard about that, that really inform thinking on these issues. So yeah. I'm gonna go home and read it at least. Um, so now heading into the last part of our program, uh, I wanna welcome Stephen Chu, Dr. Stephen Chu up to the stage, to the podium. So We're I'm gonna exit and Steve is going to tell you about the theme for next year's annual meeting and um, begin to engage you in the excitement of what's to come. Thank you. I guess, I guess I, I'll shake your hand rather than pass the baton. <laughs> so uh, before I say anything, let me first um, thank Peggy for two things, for 
um, her leadership in this meeting, but more importantly, for her leadership in the last two years and her continued leadership um, as she becomes uh, chair of the board of the AAAS. So Peggy, thank you so very much. <clears throat> I'm also um, um, not going to, I'm going to depart off script a little bit because I was actually uh, very moved and impressed by uh, Lucy's talk. Um, and as a story, and uh, Lucy, you have to pay attention. <laughs> uh, she's doing an interview, but it can wait. Um, <laughs> no, what is, so the wildflowers in California, I'm, I'm not exactly sure this is, but I remember something to the effect of 17 of the last 20 most serious fires in California are in this century. Something like that, close to that. That uh, that's statistics, but what's less boring about some of the statistics is in the last three or four years, these are tinderbox dry wildfires. And the one that's been the most deadly, uh, killing about 200 people uh, in paradise, it was the speed at which it, it spread, and literally a mile in a few minutes. And a mile in a few minutes meant that people didn't even have enough warning. They're in the cars, they were burned. And they just simply had no warning. And the speed at which these tinderbox fires are spread is a story that you can directly link and people will understand to these tinderbox dry forests over the last this century. That's, by the way, only 19 years. So, so this is something that uh, will get people's attention much more than a rising sea level 50 years from now where a half a meter. Okay, you see this right in your face. So um, uh, I'd be glad to talk to you about more of the data on that. I have it in my computer, but it's really scary. Uh, okay, so now. Um, I'm here to also help uh, introduce the uh, theme of the 2020 annual meeting. And uh, let's see, I'm not sure what's gonna happen. Does the annual meeting come up or is the bingo coming first? I'm, I'm, ah, okay, terrific. So uh, the first thing is envisioning tomorrow's earth, um, envisioning tomorrow's earth next year, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, whatever is something that I think can touch a lot of what happens in the AAAS. And many people will say, well, maybe what I do doesn't really have to anything to do with that. You're still invited and encouraged to come to AAAS <laughs> Seattle meeting. But much of what we see uh, in what is happening in climate, what is happening in agriculture, what is happening in spring rains instead of spring snows, so there's no more, uh, much less water, therefore agriculture in the United States uh, is at risk. Uh, what you can imagine where we would want to be and how to get there, rather than the direction we're heading, is, uh, encompasses some of these things. And so, um, so I all encourage you to think about it, uh, think about in your areas of science, uh, how you might be impacted, it, uh, impact this theme. Uh, again, it, you know, if, it, if what your specialty does not do that, that's okay too. But I think this is something uh, that, again, is one of those things that transcend um, the boundaries of science and transcend not only fields, but uh, from science to technology to public policy to all of these things. All right, so, so that's, uh, we hope, uh, I hope uh, you will all join us and tell your friends and colleagues that this is something. And now I'm supposed to do something about winners of a bingo competition. All right, <clears throat> now, before <clears throat> I do this, um, you always wanna know what you get for winning in bingo. And so um, um, you get, a complimentary AAAS annual meeting registration. 
You get tickets to the Seattle Museum of Pop Culture. <laughs> you get a see it all Seattle Center four packs, as I think it means the Seattle Tower among other things. And you get a $50 voucher to Healy Restaurant Group. But mostly you get the bragging rights that you want in bingo. <laughs> so now, having said that, what am I supposed to do, um, Andrew? I'm just, you know, Mongo pointing game of life. So I just reach in and, and do what? How many? Just one. Just one. Okay. You may not be here. You may not be here. And the winner is Katherine Davis from Montgomery County Public Schools, VSAS delegation. So, all right. Now. Uh, this concludes our program. Uh, thank you so much for staying and for hearing the last wonderful talk and for uh, coming to the AAAS meeting, and we all hope to see you next year. Thank you. <laughs>